um, in just a minute. And I want to welcome you to a virtual workshop series this year. Uh, so far, it's been a big hit. Um, I think with everybody cooped up at home, I think it's a great opportunity and everyone's really seeming to enjoy doing these from home. So I uh, hope you enjoy it and let us know if you have questions. Use the chat function to submit those questions to us and we will get as many of those answered as we can. Um, again, we are recording this this evening, so it will be available later if you miss any parts of it throughout the evening. And um, we offer CEU credits, so let me know if you want that. And um, without further ado, Ethan, hand it over to you. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm glad that uh, you joined us. Uh, and hopefully everyone has made it home safely or has not had to travel today. Um, so if there's any questions at any time, please let uh, Joanna know and, and she'll, let us, uh, she'll let me know and we can pause and, and answer those questions. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and we're gonna talk about anxiety tonight. And, and I did update a little bit uh, uh, my presentation. Um, this is one that I've, I've given a few times, but, but I updated it uh, a little bit to talk about some things uh, a little bit more related to um, COVID-19. And as you can see that I, I forgot to update the, the date on this. Uh, the last time I presented was in June. Um, also, like many other um, uh, uh, Zoom meetings you've probably been on, uh, there's a small chance that I might have a, a child or maybe even a dog that jumps in here. So hopefully that won't occur. We're getting ready for bed in our house. But um, but if that does occur, I'll, we'll take a small break and, and then uh, jump right back in. So. Uh, the title of the talk tonight is The Nature of Anxiety and Better Management. Um, and uh, I'll introduce myself a little bit more and then, and then we'll, we'll start talking about anxiety. So uh, I am Dr. Ethan Schwer. Uh, I'm the Director of Diagnostics uh, within the Learning Center. Um, we specialize in, in doing um, psychoeducational evaluations. Uh, a lot of times we evaluate kids with anxiety. Our bread and butter is, is uh, learning disorders and attention disorders, but something that really strongly co-occurs with that, that is anxiety. Um, and I worked in a, a few different uh, applications where, or areas where uh, we've, we've assessed and worked with anxiety um, routinely. So, all right. So I usually start off my presentations with a little bit of a clip. And so I got a, a cute clip and I got to make sure that I'm sharing my sound too. Okay. All right, so now you should be able to hear this clip. I know I say this every morning, but they're not moving. If you think it's no big deal, say something. Oh my God, you think they're dead too. I'll go check. Don't be dead, don't be dead, don't be dead. Oh, you're alive. Oh. And you're alive. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, I'm on. Your mouth smells good. Uh, oh, I'm in, I'm in here. I know. You can't just leave, guys. You gotta tell me where you're going. Is that food? Can I have some? Well, you're spitting it out. But can I have some? No? Stay right here. I'll go check on everything. I know where they are now. Everything's fine. Cornelius, come here. I'm so hungry. Well, I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. Look, I'm even doing a trick. That's how hungry I am. Faster, faster, faster. Oh. Wait, I can eat this, right? This is food? Because I've been getting some mixed signals lately. Is this food? Not for you, buddy. Is this food? That's a jacket. This has got to be food, right? Morning. Ah. Are you sure? So you're sure this is food? Oh, yeah. This is really good. That can't be good. We got to hide. We got to get out of here. Whoa. I'm okay. Why are there clothes on the floor? Why don't they smell like us? I can fix that. Are you going to help? Oh, there you are. Uh -oh. Oh. Don't panic. Goodness. I'm fine. Don't worry about me. It's fun. Please come back inside. That's not where you go. Excuse me, that's where you go. You go there. Okay guys, great news, I finished cleaning my room and- I can do a little sushi. Mm. Uh -oh. I'm not enough for sushi. What's happening? What about some this is a nightmare. Mm. I've never seen them Just fight like this salads. before. Just salads. Oh, I can't take this. Then what are we gonna eat? Oh my God, they're not talking. It's probably over. Okay, we're all freaked out. This is upsetting because I love both of you, but I'm gonna live with her because we all know I love her more. 
Okay, obviously things worked out. This is embarrassing, but we all said things we didn't mean back there, right? Thanks for letting me sleep in bed tonight, guys. You won't even know I'm here. Hey, did you guys hear that? Are you awake? So hopefully you enjoyed enjoyed that just a little bit, and I and I know that anxiety is a little bit more of a serious topic, uh, um, but I tried to make it a little bit uh, lighthearted to begin with. Uh, but jumping into our our overview and goals for for this presentation, um, we're going to be talking about that uh, neurological basis of anxiety, and and I think that's a, a really good uh, way to start off is, is starting to talk about. Uh, some of those biological underpinnings of anxiety because that is really going to help us identify what's going to work and help address the anxiety. Um, so I know that's for some people that's not their favorite thing to, to go over. Um, so we'll, I'll try to go over it relatively quickly um, but then we'll, we'll start talking about you know what is stress, what is anxiety, um, how do they differ, what are the different types of anxiety. Uh, we're going to talk about anxiety management and we'll, we'll uh, go over some things that, that you can try at home. Um, I'm going to take a, a pretty uh, holistic approach to anxiety management. I'm going to talk about therapy and medication, uh, and then I'm also going to talk about a little bit of COVID-19 considerations. So let's right. So the next I'll make sure I'm not missing anything. So I just realized I could pull up my notes. So if we talk about anxiety, um, this is a, a model of anxiety. And you'll see that it is pretty complex. It's a little bit blurry and, and, I, and I made it a little bit blurry for, for a reason um, is we didn't need to read through all of this, but I just want to kind of show that the theory and, under, and, and understanding of anxiety, it, it is, fairly complex and we still don't know uh, everything about anxiety. And the information that I'm going to be giving you today is going to be very introductory. Um, it's, uh, we could talk about uh, anxiety probably for a whole semester. So we're going to try to cover some of those basic pieces of it tonight. Now, some things that you might be able to pick out from this is you're going to see this, this little um, uh, uh, part over on the left-hand side that says external threat. In the center, you're going to see the amygdala. And so that is one of those, those central tenets of anxiety. So uh, when we talk about anxiety and they talk about brain function that, that is involved with anxiety, one of the, the center points of that is always going to be the amygdala. So first I'm gonna start off with by talking about our nervous system. Now I'm gonna come back to this slide here in a little bit. Um, there's three parts to our nervous system, the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, uh, or there's two parts. Uh, within the peripheral nervous system, there's the somatic and autonomic. And within the autonomic nervous system, there's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And these all play a, a critical role um, when we start talking about anxiety or even regulating emotions uh, um, as a whole. When we talk about our central nervous system, we're talking about the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerve cells. Okay, Most of the attention that we're going to be uh, placing uh, for this presentation is going to be within peripheral nervous system, okay? Uh, and really, we're going to we're going to center on this autonomic uh, nervous system. Um, and the sympathetic and the parasympathetic are going to be the areas that are engaged or disengaged uh, when we start talking about anxiety. Okay, uh, and they help us manage stress. They help us with with daily uh, um, life functioning. And so, so we'll come back to this um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, after we talk about uh, some of the other biological pieces. So very first, um, first off when, I, when we start talking about biological pieces, I'm gonna talk about uh, the, the brain and kind of go over just like a, a basic anatomy. Uh, we, got the, we got the frontal lobe, we got the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, uh, and, and the brainstem and the occipital lobe. Uh, the frontal lobe plays a huge role uh, with anxiety and regulating emotions. So this includes a lot of your executive function, a lot of the planful, willful behaviors. 
And if we engage our frontal lobe, we can shut off or redivert our attention to other things that will help us manage that anxiety. In fact, a lot of the therapies that are used are going to help us engage that frontal lobe to help us regulate or control that anxiety. Now, many of the other pieces of anxiety are going to be housed within this central area, which is in the, in the center part of the brain is the limbic system. Um, but that'll be connected to that frontal lobe. It'll also be connected to that parietal lobe, which is going to include some of the motor and sensation, which, which can help trigger some, some anxiety. It's also going to be connected to that temporal lobe, which is connected to your memory for your perception and language. Okay. There's also a connection with the occipital lobe as well. So the vision, uh, different visual stimuli can stimulate some of that anxiety. And then we're going to be talking about homeostasis as well. And, when we start feeling overly anxious, what can we do to get back to that level where we, we are at our basic functioning where we don't have a lot of that stress and that anxiety, okay? So what's also important, and I'm gonna go over a little bit of basic brain functioning, is talking about when this brain fully develops. And when we talk about the development of the brain, it usually starts at that central point and then it grows outward. And it takes a long time for that brain to fully mature. Uh, for females, it will uh, fully mature in late teens, early 20s. And for males, it will mature uh, mid 20s to late 20s. And, and I joke if ever. Um, but that's a critical piece for us to understand too, is, is we're talking about anxiety and we're talking about many of, the, many of you are here to talk about the children that, um, that you see with anxiety. One thing that's not fully developed is that frontal lobe. And that frontal lobe, we want to utilize that as much as we can to help us control some of that anxiety. Um, and as they grow older, this should continue to develop and we should become better at um, using our coping skills and using um, different strategies uh, and stopping some of those anxious thoughts. So the first part we're going to go over is the thalamus, okay? Uh, the thalamus uh, is something that when we bring in information um, into our brain, usually it goes into that thalamus, and then the thalamus kind of uh, uh, spreads it out to the parts of the brain where it really needs to go, okay? Uh, it interprets symptoms and then it refers to specialists. It sends the information. It's kind of that central relay station. So uh, we have on this slide, it's the brain's doctor. So it, it takes these symptoms, it diagnoses the symptoms, and then it sends it on its way to where it needs to be. Okay. But this doesn't always happen with anxiety. And I'll explain here in a little bit. Okay. One of the main central tenets of anxiety is the amygdala. This will trigger the fear response for defensive behaviors. Uh, it's, it's meant to be a, a defense mechanism. Uh, it, it will really trigger that, that fight or flight type of mentality. Uh, it is very much connected to fear uh, relations, emotional memory, and it'll receive input from the hippocampus, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus. But it also has a single neuron response for visual, auditory, and somatic um, um, areas. So there's a lot of, there's a, there's a fast track highway into that amygdala uh, and uh, that will bypass that thalamus um, and go right here to help you get into that fight or flight response. And, and that was really made to be an adaptive response so we could um, um, either fight or flight when danger was approaching and it helped us survive as, as a species. Okay. Um, it, it can become hyper, uh, responsive, uh, and they found that uh, with those with PTSD. Um, and then we have also seen that uh, it can be very well connected to, with social anxiety and generalized anxiety. Uh, so when they've done brain imaging studies, they found that uh, there's a bilateral amygdala activation uh, when, when there is social anxiety that is present, and then when there is more activation, that is very well connected to a more severe symptomology. Okay? 
And this can be reversed with targeted treatment. Like building a muscle, um, the amygdala can grow if it continues to have a lot of that stress and a lot of that anxiety. And for those with generalized anxiety disorder, they find that the volume of the amygdala grows, okay? They also find that there's higher ratios of gray matter to white matter in the upper temporal lobes of the brain as well. And once we, we, we continue to activate this and exercise it, um, it grows, but as we start to target it with therapy or with medication, we can actually see it to shrink again. So it can be very responsive to things that, that we are doing to help um, address the anxiety. I already talked about this a little bit, but that prefrontal cortex or that frontal lobe. So this connects with that amygdala. Um, this can be very well connected to um, managing symptoms of anxiety and other areas of executive function as well. Um, a lot of times the prefrontal cortex is very highly connected to ADHD or other attention disorders, but it is also very well connected to, a, to the ability to modulate emotional responses. In the hippocampus, this can also be very well connected to anxiety disorders because it is the area of the brain that is connected to memory. Um, and a lot of times we may be even unaware that we may have stored a memory um, of something that, that creates fear or, or anxiety for us. And it may be retrieved and might be sent a signal to the amygdala to actually uh, involve or, or, or heighten up that, that fear response. The last one that I'm going to go over is the hypothalamus. And so when I talk about the hypothalamus, this is what we really want um, to, to engage uh, when we try to control uh, the, the symptoms of anxiety. So this monitors our homeostasis. It regulates our behavioral and physiological activities. So it's, it's going to regulate things that we don't even really think of. Um, our body temperature, um, our heart rate, um, our digestive system, um, and, and there's, there's many other uh, pieces that, it, that it's connected to. So really when we start looking at different ways to help manage our anxiety, we're gonna try to engage this hypothalamus. Now I'm gonna go back to that one slide I said I was gonna cover again. So coming into this nervous system. And so I, I hope to bring everything all together um, so when we engage, uh, when, when anxiety presents itself, uh, the sympathetic system is activated, okay? And the sympathetic system is the part of our brain that is aroused when there's a significant stress that is placed on it, okay? And some things that it's gonna do is it's gonna shut down part of our bodies that, that we don't need, and it's gonna put us into that fight or flight response. It really is gonna trigger some of those things that are in that, um, that area of the brain, um, the, the limbic system, like the amygdala, and it's gonna engage in that so we can either fight or escape this fear that we're experiencing, okay? Once we escape that, or we, we realize that a fear or a danger is not present, uh, we're gonna engage our parasympathetic system. And the parasympathetic system is gonna include that hypothalamus, which is going to decrease some of these bodily responses. And it's gonna put us back into that area of a homeostasis. So a lot of the strategies that we're gonna be using are gonna to help to activate that parasympathetic system. And I've got an example for you. Um, over the course of the summer, um, we did a few more camping trips this year um, with, within our family and, and uh, we were able to socially distance. We figured that'd be a good way to get out and about. And one time we were at a hike at a state park and we were walking through the trees and my five-year-old daughter came across a snake. And, um, and she eventually, so the sympathetic system engaged. Uh, she shrieked, you could tell that she, um, became very tense. 
Um, I didn't look at her eyes, but I'm sure her pupils dilated. I'm, her, her heart rate increased. And I'm sure her adrenaline was pumping. And she was ready to run away from this, from this snake. Um, now, what was kind of funny, it was, it was a little bitty gardener snake. She was not in any danger. Um, and, and so well, mom and dad, we tried to engage that parasympathetic system and said, hey, we're just going to walk away from this. Look, everything is going to be better. And we tried to, we, we really did like a, a mini module of cognitive behavioral therapy or more of the cognitive, like this is, we're not, we don't need to be worried about this snake. Um, and we engaged that parasympathetic system and then she was able to calm down. Now, about five minutes later, we kept walking along this trail and then there was another snake and the sympathetic system engaged again. And then she was on high alert for the rest of that weekend. And we, we had to continue to talk to her and, and uh, help her through, through that fear response that she was having. Um, but I think my main message here is, is we want to talk about how we can engage that parasympathetic system. And especially in industrialized countries, there are higher rates of anxiety. And I think that things move at a very fast pace. And um, in some of uh, the Western civilization, we, we have a lot more competitiveness and, and uh, we, we want to be the best at things. And we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. And we may be engaged in our sympathetic system too much to a point where it becomes a little bit more maladaptive. And we need to get back to that point where we get that parasympathetic system where we're back into that level of homeostasis. Okay. I want to make a pause or, or do a quick pause here. And I am moving through this fairly quickly. Uh, make sure that there's not any questions? I haven't had anything come in yet, Ethan. Okay. So, well, if there's no questions, then we'll jump into talking about what are some of those definitions of anxiety. Okay. So, what is anxiety? When does it occur? And and who does it affect the most? Okay. And I think we need to make a distinction here between fear and anxiety. So when we talk about fear, that the definition that we have is that it's an emotional response to a real or perceived imminent threat. Now, anxiety is the anticipation of a future threat. And that threat can be a lot of different things. For some, it might be taking a test. For some, it might be, um, you know, am I gonna get this job promotion? Uh, in our current times, it might be, you know, is my family going to be okay? Am I going to contract um, coronavirus? Um, you know, am I going to ever be able to see family or are things going to return back to normal? I mean, so there are a lot of anxieties that, that are occurring right now. Okay. Um, now, when we talk about that anxiety or that fear, that is going to trigger that sympathetic system. Okay. Um, and, and when we talk about anxiety, it's really associated highly with muscle tension, with avoidance, and then being vigilant for danger. Okay. Oh, got a question. Okay, so I see a question that says, and I'm going to read it to, to everyone so we're, we're all on the same page. So in learning about regulating the amygdala, it was recommended to try to engage the child in an organizational task to help downregulate. Is this an exercise that you recommend? Um, you know, I've never heard of like an organizational task, but one of the things that we're going to be talking about, and, and, and this could still work, um, anything to really help get your mind off that task, and we're going to even talk about COVID-19, you know, we are, we are inundated with a whole bunch of information with COVID-19, and that does make a lot of people anxious. So one of the things is try to remove ourselves from that situation that is going to provoke those thoughts. 
and and maybe doing an organizational task will really help that. Now, I've never I've never heard of this one specifically, but I think that's how that is operating: is it gets your mind off of that and makes you think about something else, and gets your body back into that homeostasis. So it, it could work. It's kind of tricking them into thinking something else. Okay, so um, going back into uh, anxiety, um, anxiety is something that has a very strong genetic component to it, but it includes both genetic and environmental contributions. Okay. Um, most times that they're, they're, when someone has anxiety, there's a predisposition of that anxiety, but it's the, that manifestation uh, with the environment uh, and, and the manifestation of the interaction between the environment and genetics that really cause that anxiety. When we start talking about an anxiety disorder, we start we are talking about an excessive amount of anxiety. Um, everyone feels some level of anxiety at some point in time, um, but when it starts overtaking your life and it's excessive uh, and it's beyond what is developmentally appropriate, so we usually will say it's going to be lasting for about six months or more. Um, that's when it starts to be getting to that level of excessive. And we do see that most anxiety disorders occur in females more than males at, at about a two to one clip. Okay. And, and so this is kind of getting at to uh, when does it occur and who does it affect the most. So more often in females than males. Uh, and most anxiety symptoms are going to start to develop in that childhood time frame and persist if not treated. In some recent research, they, will, they have actually said that one in four people will experience clinical levels of, of anxiety at some point in their lives. That's 25% of the population. So that's a, that's a pretty startling uh, statistic in my mind. Um, I'm looking at my notes here real quick, see if there's anything else that I wanna cover within this. And so, and, and one of the things that it really affects is those that are anxious are more prone to say that negative future life events will occur. So it puts them in the state where they are not fully happy or optimistic with their life. So it does have that, um, it does have that very negative uh, outcome or effect. Now, many people will, will pair stress and anxiety together and, and say that these two words mean exactly the same thing. And they are, but they aren't. Um, stress is really a simple definition is when those external demands are greater than our internal resources. Okay. Stress and anxiety, and anxiety will, will likely occur when that happens as well when we have a little bit more of that stress. And we're talking about anxiety and stress that can be maladaptive, but there are some levels where it can be very, very helpful. And I think that is also a very important to note in this presentation. You're gonna be talking about how to manage it and, and how to work through it, but also know that some of this is normal. Um, and we're not going to completely get rid of it, and some of it can actually improve our um, um, how well we do things. Uh, they 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 have studied this, and those that have a little bit of anxiety or a little bit of stress before a test usually outperform those that do not. Okay, now there's there's a trade off where this will go up, and if you have too much anxiety, your performance goes down. So you you want to be at that level where it is not. Um, it's not overtaking your life and it's not overtaking your resources, but it puts you on that, that alertness and that, that point where you can succeed. So we, we want to find that healthy balance. So when we talk about that healthy balance, we're gonna be talking about emotional processing, and this is gonna be a little bit different for each individual. And there's three big components, evaluation, um, how expressive it is, and, and experiential piece. So with the evaluation, is it aversive? 
Um, there are some people that get highly anxious or have fears when they see spiders. Some do not. Um, so, so it is dependent on that person perceiving this as being aversive. And this can be paired with previous condition and behavioral reinforced experiences. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Expressive. Um, our reactions um, can range quite a bit. Uh, when, some, when, when one person feels a little bit of anxiety, um, they might be able to cope and, and deal with that. While others, would, when they uh, experience something, their expressive responses may be um, uh, much more heightened. And you might see the physical piece, you might see uh, the inattention, you might, or you might not even be able to see it, but it might be all internalized. But there is a big range with how expressive these feelings are. And it is very much experiential. So it's very subjective to the experience and to that individual. So let's talk a, a little bit about the different types of anxiety. And, and when I start to talk about the different types of anxiety, I'm going to be talking at those clinical levels. So first is that generalized anxiety disorder. Okay. And, and this comes right out of the DSM-5. So these are some of the main points when we look at making a diagnosis. So that, that there needs to be excessive worry more days than not. Generally, we're going to say that this needs to last six months or longer. And it can include three or more of the following, restlessness, fatigue, concentrating, or mind going blank, irritability, muscle tension, and sleep disturbance. I'm going to pause here for just a second. So some of these may not even sound like anxiety. Okay. And the reason I want to pause here is kind of going over that, and some of these may even sound like something else. Irritability could be connected to, you know, is this a normal teenage thing? Or is this, you know, maybe a depressive type of symptom? Concentrating your mind going blank. When I hear that, I really think of, you know, possible inattentive types of ADHD, restlessness. I think of the hyperactive impulsiveness. Yeah. Um, now, what is very interesting is this is the adult criteria for children. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm kind of pausing a little bit for a little bit of an emphasis. There only needs to be one. Many times children may go undiagnosed um, and they may be feeling anxiety and they may not be able to express what they're feeling and it may come out as being irritable or having trouble concentrating. And, and this is an important thing for us to consider because like I said, that trouble concentrating, many of us might consider this maybe a symptom of ADHD. And if it's really anxiety instead of an ADHD, then if we try to medicate that person, we could have some adverse effects. Sometimes those with anxiety disorders will respond adversely if we give them a stimulant medication that is often given to those with ADHD. So there, there needs to be a little bit of, uh, we need to be careful with that. Um, and, and just because a, a teacher or a family member sees that there are some struggles with concentrating, that doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's, uh, it, it's attention related, but it may not be like an attention disorder. This could be caused by anxiety. Okay. Uh, question is, what age is child? Uh, child is uh, under the age of 18. So the prevalence, uh, the prevalence is about 1% in adolescents, 3% in adults. Um, this is one of those that it is females two to one. Generally this peaks in middle age then dissipates. Okay. Um, and the, one of the theories around that is once you start getting into that middle age, your 30s, your 40s, that's when you start having kids. You start worrying more for your kids. You're, you're growing in your career. I mean, there's a lot of things interacting at once. Um, and as your children grow older, 
and maybe moving out of the house. And then once you get into your 50s and 60s, a lot of that anxiety kind of kind of goes away. And and um, uh, but usually your median onset of this is going to be at about 30 years of age. That does that mean that it can't be diagnosed when when you are uh, younger than that? Um, and that yes, it absolutely can be. We do have. Uh, children as young as eight or nine that, that have an anxiety disorder, uh, and it's very common uh, in teens. Um, especially, we see this oftentimes um, in those that put a lot of pressure on themselves or that may be in a, a more of a competitive setting. Okay, this is this disorder is much more common with European descent population, and it's also more common in, in the developed countries. Now, what's important also with generalized anxiety disorder, and, and when I was researching this, and I found this out a few years ago, uh, and I've had lots of trainings on anxiety, this was not something that I, I ever found, is generally your full remission of generalized anxiety disorder is very low. You can get better and you have periods of time where, where those symptoms are not as, as expressive, but then there'll be times where it gets worse. So it's not always um, um, at, that, at that level where it's, it's noticeable. Uh, there's a question, does anxiety typically increase with old age or does it depend on the person? Uh, it definitely does depend on the person. Generally, when we talk about generalized anxiety disorder, um, this is something that is going to uh, start to dissipate as, as people get older. But does that mean that's the case for every single person? Absolutely not. And there are older people that also do have a lot more uh, anxiousness. And sometimes that, can, that anxiousness or even depressive symptomology can be paired with um, you know, even just a little bit of that, that mental decline with that, um, when that prefrontal cortex um, and, and when the brain starts to, um, um, the, the brain doesn't function as fully as it did as we grow older and our ability to regulate and modulate some of these things uh, is, is not as strong either. All right, very good questions. So that's generalized anxiety disorder. Any questions on generalized anxiety disorder before I move on to separation anxiety disorder? Separation anxiety disorder. Um, so this is one that, that is, is usually seen um, pretty early. Uh, characterized most often by excessive fear or worry when separating from an attached individual. Usually this is going to be mom or dad. Um, and this fear can be that they're going to fear of losing this attachment figure. Um, it also can be a fear that they are going to, that an unwanted event may happen, like they may be, get lost or they may get kidnapped. Okay. Um, a lot of times we'll see uh, children that, that really struggle with separation anxiety uh, when, when parents drop them off at school. Those are the ones that want to hug mom and dad that don't want to be dropped off at school. They also may not like going to sleep without knowing that they are near that attachment figure. Um, when we talk with families that, that have separation anxiety, uh, many times um, uh, the child is sleeping in the room with the parents or maybe even in the same bed. Okay. Um, so this needs to occur for at least four weeks in children and six months in advance, six months for adults, uh, very much affected by cultural characteristics. Uh, in the United States overall uh, culture, uh, we consider ourselves to be pretty independent. Um, and so when we see this excessive fear of worry with the separation, uh, it doesn't match kind of what our, our cultural identity is in the, in the United States for the most part, and, but it is different based on different subpopulations. Now, if you go to many Eastern countries where there, it's, it's much more family oriented and it's, it's much more dependent on each other, um, it's not as 
as prevalent separation anxiety in, in those settings. And to diagnose it, um, it, it takes on a different spin than in the United States. So this is going to occur in about um, one to 2% of the population, more often in children, decreases as you age. This one's equal for males and females and children. And this is one where there is, there can be that, that full remission. Another one that I'm very glad that we are covering is social anxiety disorder because the title of this uh, um, kind of misleads us to some extent. So social anxiety disorder is gonna be that marked fear or anxiety with specific social, social situations. It can be performing in front of others. So if I have performance fears, I'd probably not be able to come out and, and do this talk with you guys today. I wouldn't be able to come out and, and present in front of people. Um, but the other one is worried about being humiliated or rejected. This is one where if there is test anxiety, this is where it's housed and where it lives. So someone with social anxiety, anxiety may not want to be called on in class. They may struggle with tests because they might feel like they are stupid or they might fear that they might be rejected or, or humiliated by others. Or if the teacher calls them out, if they got a bad grade, they might not be living up to their expectations or others' expectations. So there's a lot of that concern with being humiliated or rejected that may uh, affect school performance. This needs to be present six months or more. Its prevalence um, is 7% of the population uh, or 7% of population in the US, it's lower in other parts of the world. And I, I attribute this to our higher levels of competitiveness in, in the US. Um, we, we have a concept where we're gonna pull up our bootstraps and we're gonna work through different things and, and we need to be the best that we can be. Um, and that's, really how we raise our kids. And you know, there's a lot of positive aspects to that, but this is one of the drawbacks to it. Uh, prevalence decreases with age, it is higher with American Indians, but lower with Asian, Latino, and African American populations. This one is very close to equal between males and females, but it is slightly higher in females. And in children, this can be expressed with tantrums, with freezing, with clinging, with with failing to speak. So there are some pieces to this um, that may look a little bit more like that separation anxiety, but it might actually be, uh, uh, when you dig deeper into it, it's that social anxiety. Also, the social anxiety has a much stronger genetic disposition to it. So when they've done twin studies, they have found much more connection with this with monozygotic twins versus dizygotic. So that means that, that that genetic presence is much more a factor than the environment. Ethan, it looks like we have a couple questions coming in. Okay. Um, the first one is says, would the fear of letting mom and dad down fall under social anxiety? Uh, most likely I would say yes. Um, now it needs to be excessive, um, but yes, I think that would fall underneath that category. Uh, yeah. They would be fearing that there's some sort of humiliation or rejection from mom or dad. Okay. And then the second question that came in, it says, is this likely to last, is this likely for children? I think there's just, for, for sorry, I'm struggling children. to read it. So, so youngest <laughs> children, keeping up with their older yeah. brothers and sisters. Yeah, uh, and and I am not aware of, of any uh, research or or uh, any indication on that. Um, so I don't know if it's any more prevalent uh, based on on your your uh, birth order on this one. Um, I guess that could be true, but I'm unaware of of that. Good questions. Now I'm going to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. Now in the DSM-5, this is not really listed underneath anxiety disorders any longer, uh, but it's very uh, much associated with it. Okay, And a lot of times 
uh, PTSD can come across as either anxiety or depression, and, and anxiety and depression can still occur with PTSD, um, but sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes PTSD can also be affecting the, the other executive functions like maintaining attention, uh, regulating behaviors, and those things as well. So with this one, um, we're going to be talking about exposure to an actual or threatened death, injury, or, or sexual violence. Okay, And there's going to be some intrusion symptoms, um, some, some recurrent and intrusive memories, dreams, or um, prolonged psychological distress. Okay. There may, may be a persistence avoidance of associated stimuli. Then you may also have some of those negative altercations in cognitions and moods. Um, now, PTSD uh, is, is found to be um, more common in females than males. Um, does anybody know why this is? We'll see if I can stop and see if I can get someone to answer a question. Give it a few more seconds, see if anyone chimes in. Why is PTSD, does it occur more often in females than males? Okay, nothing's popping up. So quite simply, and this is sad, it's they are just much more likely to be exposed to traumatic experiences. Um, they're more likely to be victims of, of sexual, physical abuse. Um, and, and yep, someone, someone uh, chimed in. So it, it is definitely the abuse. So, all right. Um, in, the, in the United States, the lifetime prevalence is about 9%. So about one in 10 will struggle a PTSD um, in their life, higher rates among non-whites non and more common among females. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how anxiety can be learned and, that, and I'm gonna show a few different videos. So, and this also talks into the therapy that we're gonna be using. Um, a lot of times anxiety can be conditioned by different things. And, and so this is gonna be a simplistic view of it. And I'm gonna show you a little video about Albert. And this is probably one of the more famous psychology studies that's been done. Um, and it, it gets into um, uh, classical conditioning, okay? And, and what they're gonna do is, is they're going to initiate a fear response in this baby. Uh, and, and you're gonna see this and, and you'll probably even, it'll probably tear at you just a little bit. Now, um, this is a study that, that would never be allowed to be done any longer. Um, but, uh, so keep that in mind as you're watching this. So I'll turn up my volume and show you this clip. In the early part of the 20th century, psychologists John Watson and Rosalie Rayner set out to teach a baby boy called Little Albert to fear white rats using the principle of classical conditioning. This is a film of their work. The film shows several phases of their study. First, as you see here, the investigators demonstrated that prior to conditioning, Little Albert had no fears of any animals, including, of course, white rats. Watson and Rayner then sought to teach Albert to fear white rats through classical conditioning. 
in the conditioning phase of the study, which was not filmed, the investigators struck a steel bar with a hammer whenever Albert reached for a rat, making a very loud noise that greatly upset and frightened Albert. After six such pairings of the loud noise in the rat, it was believed that the boy had been conditioned to fear white rats. That is, Albert was now expected to react fearfully to white rats, whether the rats were paired with loud noises or not. In this next film sequence, we see Albert interacting with a white rat after the conditioning process. The investigators believed that the child's reaction during this trial demonstrated his newly acquired fear of white rats. Finally, the investigators expected that little Albert's conditioned fear of white rats would generalize to stimuli that were similar in key ways to a white rat. In this film segment, they were trying to demonstrate that the child now also reacted fearfully to similar objects, such as a rabbit, a dog, a furry object, and a white mask worn by Watson himself. All right, that's kind of a horrible study, isn't it? All right, I'm pulling up my slides again. All right, so what we find is that, that we are able to disconnect some of these condition responses when we start talking about anxiety. We also know that clinically anxious groups, those that have those clinical levels of anxiety, show stronger learning of those novel condition fear associations than lower anxious groups. So that bond and that tight is, is much stronger for them. And when we talk about ex, ex, uh, extinction and, and removing uh, some of these associations, we never really erase the previous memories. We just learn new associations between the stimuli and our reactions. Okay. So I'm gonna start talking a little bit about what do we do for this anxiety? And, and a lot of this, I'm, I told you, I'm gonna take a little bit of that holistic approach and, and things that we do on a daily basis. So this isn't gonna be like, like groundbreaking things, but it's things that we need to remind ourselves uh, on what to do. So we need to be proactive. We need to engage in physical health. We find need to find that, that healthy support system, maybe doing some therapy, other outlets that can help you. Um, altruistic behaviors, uh, knowing when you engage in those and you give your time and yourself uh, to, to charity or to other organizations or, or donating or helping others, uh, that has been very much connected with um, um, less negative emotional responses and simply just making your life simpler. Um, um, the, the busyness of our lives uh, can create a lot more stress um, and, and actually I think that's a little bit of a silver lining of, of this, this pandemic that we're in is, is we are a little bit more simplified in many aspects or hopefully we are. I see a question. Okay, so, uh, and the question is, is uh, when are we gonna start talking about how do we manage anxiety? And so that's what we're doing right now, okay? So first part of that, that anxiety is, is some of doing those protective factors, okay? Now, I like to go over some things that I call my grandma rules. Okay. Um, I see one more question popping in. Oh, maybe not. Um, so these are things when, when I do reports with, with children and with families, I usually end my reports with what I call my grammar rules. And, and quite simply, these are things that are backed by research that have a very strong um, um, uh, 
they're, they're, they're pretty easy to do and they have a, a very strong effects. And the first one is sleep. So if we talk about being able to regulate um, our, our attention or regulate our anxiety or doing many things, we need to have adequate sleep. And, and so this is very, very important. Um, we should be getting nine to 11 hours of sleep uh, per night for our elementary age kids. And these, these numbers, and you'll, if you look at different websites, you'll see some slight variation in these numbers. These come from the National Sleep Federation. I think the American Academy of, of Pediatrics has some numbers that are just slightly different from these, uh, but these are gonna be right in there. So nine to 11 hours for el um, elementary age kids eight to nine hours for teenagers and seven to eight for adults, okay? Um, so if we get good sleep, we are gonna be able to operate our brain to that full capacity um, to address uh, or, and, and control some of that anxiety. Another thing is proper diet, and I'm gonna talk about that within that next slide, is we need to eat as many whole foods as we can, avoid excess sugars, uh, things that are going to put us, that's, that's going to hijack our system um, so that we are not operating at its full efficiency. Exercise has been very, found to be very, very powerful. Um, and there have been some studies that have shown that exercise can be just as effective as therapy, can be just as effective as um, uh, medication, and, and sometimes even more so. Um, so getting that adequate exercise can make a big difference. And then meditation, and that's connected actually to some of the therapy uh, pieces that we're also gonna talk about here in a little bit. Um, and there have been some studies that have actually shown that meditation can be as, if not more effective uh, than medication for mild to moderate levels of anxiety. So I talked a little bit about nutrition. And, and I'm gonna talk a little, little bit about, about sugar, caffeine. Um, one, if we have too much caffeine in our bodies, and, and, and maybe you have experienced this if you've had too much coffee or, or um, had too many java beans or something. If you have too much caffeine, that can make us overly jittery and actually can put us into kind of a, a lower level uh, of, of psychosis. So we do need to manage it how much caffeine we're having. And then that can also affect um, our sleep cycle. So we have to be very careful with, with the caffeine that we're ingesting. Also with sugar, um, sugar is something that we are seeing entered into our foods more and more these days. And it's quite astonishing um, um, how much sugar that we should actually be intaking and how much we are actually uh, ingesting. Um, on this slide, this little diagram off on the right side shows that the daily added sugar limit, and this is recommended by the American Heart Association for men, and this is adult men, they should have no more than 36 grams of added sugar per day. And for women, they should have no more than 25 grams. Okay, So what that equates to is 36 grams is really one 12 ounce can of Coke. And that is it. Um, and we talk about added sugar, it's things that where we add sugar that, are, that go on the, the basic limit. So if we have an apple, if we have a banana, that is not added sugar. Um, now, if we, in a smoothie, if we put in, you know, 10 or 15 bananas, that, that's a different story because that's not something that we normally consume. But sugar can really affect how our body is operating. Um, and it, it can put us, it has that, that, um, it has that, that ability to, to put us on edge and then we crash from that. Um, so that's one of the big things is if we eat right, that should also help with our ability to manage that anxiety. Um, one of the other examples I give with this sugar piece um, is I'm a, a huge lover of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And one time I looked at, at what, uh, the added sugar I was with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I noticed that with one peanut butter and jelly sandwich, that a lot of the sugar, um, uh, the, the sugar amount was more than my daily intake. And we knew that a lot of it, I knew that a lot of it was come from the jelly, but I did not know that just the bread, and I had 100% whole wheat bread, 
And then uh, the peanut butter was also had a lot of added sugar into it. So that's something definitely to be mindful of as we're talking about how do we manage that, that anxiety. Because we want to be at that level of homeostasis. And if we add in that sugar, um, that's really going to affect things. I already talked a little bit about exercise. These are some of the positive benefits of exercise. So we have that increased oxygenation, increased endorphins. It's going to improve our circulation. It's also going to improve that digestion system and our metabolism. And there have been, has been research also that shows that there is a very strong link between our gut health and, and our um, emotional health um, and overall health. Um, so that exercise has a, a lot of positive effects. Like I said in my grandma rules, uh, meditation has a really strong effect. And so one of the things I'm going to do right now is I'm going to do a little bit of an exercise with meditation, and then I'll talk a little bit more about meditation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if you will uh, play along uh, with me. Uh, and, and, and so this is just one example of uh, a meditation exercise. So we're gonna do what's called the five senses exercise. So first, if you're at home, I want you to try to get as comfortable in your chair as you can. I want you to close your eyes and start taking a few deep breaths. And I want you to inhale through your nose and then exhale or exhale slowly through your mouth like you are blowing through a straw. And I want your breaths to be somewhat exaggerated. So big deep breath in. Hold. Slow deep breath out. Big deep breath in. Slow deep breath out. I want you to do that a few more times. We'll take a few minutes for you to take a few more deep breaths. keeping your eyes closed and continuing with your breaths, I want you to notice five things around you that you can see without opening your eyes. Picture where they are at in your room in relation to you. You can picture their color, how far they are from you. As you continue with your deep breaths, continue to try to focus and name five things that you can see. In your mind, try to visualize it. And notice as many characteristics as you can. Continue with your breaths and keep your eyes closed. Now notice four things that you can feel. Bring awareness to yourself. You can feel things that might be uncomfortable for you. Or you might be able to feel the heat coming in through a heat vent. The feeling might be internal or external. Now I want you to notice three things that you can hear. Take a moment to listen to them. 
It might be things in the background. Now, notice two things that you can smell. Again, bring your awareness to it. Whether it's a pleasant or unpleasant smell, just be aware of it. Now I want you to focus on that taste in your mouth. It might be an aftertaste of dinner that you had that was great, or your mouth may be dry. Kind of focus in on that, that taste and whatever that sensation is in your mouth. Lastly, take a few more deep breaths. And then slowly open your eyes. Now, hopefully some of you engaged in this. And I'm hopeful, Joanna, can we see? I'm hopeful that some of you will talk about how you feel after you did this exercise, kind of what, and, and Joanna, can we give them a, a chance to, to speak and can we unmute them and give them access to speak? Um, with the webinar function, no, but they could use the chat feature. Okay. All right, so if someone would be willing, to, uh, I'm hoping that I can hear from a few of you um, to talk about how you are feeling following this, basic meditation exercise. I'm seeing a few. All right. So some are saying lighter, relaxed. So relaxing. Okay, calm. I feel more dialed in uh, to the present, good. Very grounded and calm, relaxed. One person said, thank you. Okay, so a lot of this is, is um, if, if you read through some of the comments that are here, a lot of these are going to be saying that um, that there's a little bit more of that connection, I'm more aware, I feel more calm. And, and this was one of, the, that one of those main points that I was, I was trying to, to make at the beginning of the presentation and why it was important to talk about engaging that, that uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic system. And that's really what we were trying to do there is we were trying to um, engage that parasympathetic system and really, this is a very simple strategy that we can use in almost any circumstance, okay? Um, whether I'm driving down the road and someone cuts me off or, you know, one of the, one of the places I really despise driving is in Chicago, and that really does uh, ramp up my, my anxiety and my stress level. Uh, now, I might not be able to close my eyes, but I can slow down and take a few deep breaths and concentrate and be aware of where I'm at. 
um, before I sit down and I take a test, I can take a few deep breaths and, and, um, and bring and center myself. Um, same thing as if right before I'm going into a job interview um, or, or anything else that might create a little bit of stress, I can ground myself. So this is something that can be done in, in, um, in most situations um, and, and scenarios. Um, so, in one of the occasions, one of the questions that I am seeing is, can you recommend specific avenues for meditation for children? Strong websites, how can we guide children through the meditation? Okay. Um, so, I'm going to jump into a little bit more with, um, within that, this meditation piece. So this is one of those exercises or things that you can do to help manage the, the, the anxiety, okay? So here are some resources for meditation. So there are some websites out there that, that have different um, uh, webinars or things that you can go through. So mindful.org, um, University of Minnesota has got uh, mindfulness that they have a, I think an eight or a 12 week course, uh, that is something that you do have to pay for, but it's, it's a, a very strong, good uh, course. There's also this website, this mindfulness website, and I'm not even sure how to say that, the Pelios Mindfulness. This engages in um, um, a mindfulness um, um, series that actually many researchers use um, when they are doing research on mindfulness. So and that, that last time I checked is free. And the Mindfulness Awareness Research Center out of UCLA is a, is a very good web page as well. There's also some very good TED Talks. Now, when I start talking about things that we can do with, within our children, is a lot of times I do point to a few apps that are out there. Head, Headspace, Calm, uh, and these are a few of them, but there are a ton of mindfulness apps. And there's also a ton of YouTube videos. Um, and when we talk about mindfulness, there are many different ways that we can engage in mindfulness. Uh, we can do a walk outside and just try to, to be in touch with nature. We can do yoga. Uh, we can sit and do a deep breathing. Uh, we, can, we can kind of focus on our senses like we just did. So it, it's kind of finding what the child will enjoy doing and, and trying to limit the distractions and just kind of engage into that. Now, one thing that, that I have noticed, um, the Calm app, okay. uh, if you are an Amer American Express card holder, uh, you can download the Calm app. Is, is, most of these apps are free, but then you need to pay for uh, continuing sessions with them. And the Calm app and everything involved with it is completely free right now during this coronavirus, uh, and that's a perk for the American Express. So that's something else that's out there for you. Okay, I saw a few more things that are that are flashing up in terms of comments. I want to make sure that I'm not missing anything. How do you get a teenager who is irritated already and thinks that this is useless? Um, and that really is the million dollar question um and and i don't have a great answer for that uh, um, a lot of times the question that i get is is going to be um you know how do i get my children to do this um and and it's try to make it as fun and enjoyable as possible maybe do it as a family thing now for the teenager it may be useful to use a somewhat different approach uh, and I'm going to talk about that next. They may not, you know, with mom and dad, they may not listen to mom and dad. They may not want to do this, this meditation thing. And, and quite honestly, at times, this meditation thing can be boring. Um, and it's not something that we really want to do. We want to, we want to check Facebook. We want to check Snapchat. We want to, you know, do this or that. We, want, we don't want to sit down and just breathe and be for a moment. But it's so important that we do. Um, so the other thing that we could do with that teenager is we could talk about therapy and most therapy that is out there um, are going to include an aspect of meditation. And quite honestly, um, therapy has, has really been found to be more effective than, than medication. Um, and I'll talk about uh, 
I'm not going to talk too much about medication. There are some medications that are super helpful among those that, that have anxiety, but usually therapy is the most effective. And, and the go-to most often is the cognitive behavioral therapy, which is there's a focus on understanding and changing thinking and behavior pattern, patterns. Okay, Kind of like when I was talking about um, when, when my daughter saw the snake, um, we were doing our nature walk. Um, we kind of focus on understanding that the chances of us seeing another snake are going to be very slim. They're more scared of us than, than we are of them. Uh, they're very tiny. They're not going to harm us. So we really tried to understand, you know, I had this fear of this snake, um, but really tried to really understand that really this is probably not a big deal. Uh, and, and this is similar to anxiety is we're going to focus on understanding things that causes cause us that anxiousness and really focus in on them and try to address them and try to remove those misunderstandings that we have already created in our own minds. And really with CBT, we learn skills that can be applied throughout life and we see effectiveness after eight weeks, but more pronounced effects between 12 and 16 weeks. And we're going to return to that question about what do we do with the teenagers that are more irritable and that don't want to do this. My best recommendation would be hopefully to get them in therapy and find a therapist that they can build rapport with, someone that they can find that connection with. And really that's one of the most um, uh, um, positive, that, that, that creates the most positive outcomes out of therapy is having that good rapport with a therapist. Uh, and that would be my avenue that, that, that I would try. Um, Exposure therapy, this is usually more for fears of uh, or phobias where we try to expose them a little bit more at a time to, to a different situations. This can be used with some of that social anxiety with fear of public speaking. So you can slowly work up to that. Acceptance and commitment therapy, which is that blend of mindfulness, which is what we just did, and behavior change. Now, a lot of times your cognitive behavioral piece will also include some of that mindfulness. Dialectical behavior therapy. It combines practices of CBT and mindfulness as well. It uses both individual and group therapy. And then the interpersonal therapy. So these are different therapy modes that can be used to address that anxiety. Most often it's gonna be that the CBT, and you're gonna find a lot of resources within the Twin Cities. If you need resources for therapists uh, and you email me, uh, and my, my contact information is on this on at the end of this presentation. I'd be happy to send those to you. Okay. I would just just ask if you do email me, just be patient. Usually after the presentations, I do get a lot of emails. Okay, I'm trying to I dropped my presentation slide. Okay. So medications. So medications with anxiety, we're, we're going to talk about both antidepressants. And, and those that really target the anxiety. With, with children, with adolescents, there's a lot more concern with some of the antidepressants and they need to be managed and watched carefully. Now, in addition to this therapy, there have been some alternative practices that have, that's got growing amount of evidence that it's effective. Yoga is one of those, acupuncture is another. In fact, acupuncture is one of those things that is covered by more and more insurances. So that might be something that might be willing to try. And if you've got a teenager, that might be something that they might be willing to do, something that's new, something that's different, and then sitting down and just breathing. Another thing that's out there is what's called the Northwestern University Suite of Apps. Okay, so this is IntelliCare. Okay, and so you're gonna, this will take you to this website. And the, these are apps that are free that were developed at Northwestern University uh, from a grant that they received uh, from the, the National Institute of Mental Health um, to help manage anxiety, depression. And so they have all these different apps that you can use to help you with um, your, your functioning and your day-to-day -day living. Now, I also talked about some things with COVID-19. So some things that, that I have found out there with, within the COVID-19, a lot of these things are going to be very similar to what I talked about managing your stress and your anxiety. 
So the first one is these top 10 tips for, for, uh, for anxiety and depression or from the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. And so this is the website of that. And these are their top 10 tips. And sometimes we may need to distance ourselves from media. Uh, maybe turning off the news, maybe stepping away from Facebook or from Instagram with all this information about coronavirus. Um, take a break from that. Um, and and that, that may continue to flood or exacerbate that anxiety that we are feeling. Don't engage in the worry. Do different things that's going to take your mind off, off of it. Um, uh, earlier in our presentation, someone asked us about, you know, if we do something uh, in organizational type of, 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 of a task. Um, Will, will that work? Well, maybe it will. That might take our mind off it. If we exercise, if we do other things that help us uh, disengage from the worry, that will be helpful. Um, focus on those present odds uh, and do not react to physical symptoms. So really, this is kind of taking that cognitive approach and saying, hey, no, we need to, this is the reality of things. Uh, we really don't need to be engaged in this worry and kind of shutting down that worry. Okay. Uh, focus on being productive and, and new ways of enjoying life. Um, I have commonly said that, that the silver lining in this, so I've got four young ones at home. And prior to this, I was constantly running from one activity to another activity. And now we're able to spend a lot more time together as a family. Um, and and our, our nights are a lot less chaotic. Um, we're able to sit down and play games. Together. We're able to watch movies together. We, we talk a lot more. Uh, and some of those might be that silver lining uh, within this. Okay. Engage in stress reduction activities. We covered some of these. Um, do not go beyond CDC guidelines. Try to get some sense of normalcy. Be kind to your others and have faith. And seek out professional help if it's becoming too worrisome. And one of the nice things that's happened also with this COVID-19 is, is there is much more of this teletherapy that is, that is occurring. And, and some of the research that's coming out shows that that can be just as effective as the in-person therapy. In fact, it reaches more of an audience, uh, those that may not be able to access therapy, um, um, that now they can through, through the use of a phone or through the use of, of a video conference. The, this is information that's put out by the CDC. Okay, first is knowing what to do if you are sick, know how to get treatment, take care of your emotional health. Uh, and and if, with this slide presentation, you can click on these links and it, and it does have links to these different things. But also it talks about taking breaks from watching, reading news stories, taking care of your body. These are the same things that I was talking about that fit within my, my grandma rules, okay? Make time to unwind. Uh, connect with others as we can. And, and so that is probably the most difficult piece within uh, our current situation in the pandemic is I think they talk about having those little bubbles that you can have where you can connect with others, those that you know that are kind of living a, a lifestyle and, and uh, that are that's similar to yours, but not also overdoing that. So, um, you know, for, for instance, in our neighborhood, we try to have a weekly uh, a campfire. Um, and it's just those little neighbors that are in our neighborhood that, that, we, that are social distancing and doing things the same thing the way that we are, okay? Connect with your community or faith-based organization. Try to be involved as much as you can. Okay, I also have a list of books for you. Uh, and there's a lot of different resources that are here. And I have my website now. I do also see that there are some uh, additional questions. So I'm going to try to go through some of these questions as well. So the question is, what do we do when we're in the middle of a fit? Okay. When we're in the middle of a fit, uh, that is not going to be the right time for us to engage in in. You know, if we can engage in, in, in mindfulness, and if we can, um, um, if we can get ourselves to to start thinking about something else that might um, distance ourselves uh, from what we're thinking and the word that we're having, you know, we want to engage with that, but that does not always work. 
the best thing about the fit is, is being proactive about it, talking about what are we going to do when we are in a fit? What are going to be the strategies that we do? And then trying to implement those more and more. So, so it's more about, you know, what, what can, not about what can we do what, when we're right in the middle of that fit, is what can we do to um, address so we don't fall into that fit or then find that strategy that we're going to use while we're in that fit. And so that'll be working with that individual. Okay, there is a, another question. In the past, I've heard of some schools trying to use meditation as an intervention tool for elementary students. Uh, for example, when students were sent to the office, instead of having them sit in the room, they would have them meditate. Have you seen any studies that have shown the effect of, them, of this? I also do a presentation on me uh, meditation and mindfulness, so I am very well versed with this. And yes, the effect of, of, effectiveness of this is actually quite strong. Um, the, uh, and as I'm answering this, I saw another question that popped up that said, um, and I showed a list of books again, so I'm going to have that being presented as I'm talking. Um, so the effectiveness of doing meditation in school is quite strong. They have found that, that those that do from a school-wide approach, uh, they can improve social skills, they can improve academic outcomes, um, and there, there are less discipline referrals to the office. Uh, there are many um, um, advantages of doing uh, these meditation mindfulness activities in school, um, even in preschoolers where they simply lay down on the ground and they put their hands on their tummies and they're, they're feeling their, their tummies rise and fall with their breaths um, and, and learning how to uh, sense their own bodily reactions. There's a lot of positive effects with meditation mindfulness. What are your tips for teaching your child to acknowledge or identify to find that anxiety is impacting their life? Um, I think my answer to this one is going to be, um, it is, it's gonna be based a little bit on how I approach my parenting with my own children. Um, and, and really children sometimes don't even identify that they are being anxious. They know that something is off. They know that something's wrong. And I think that's where this question is coming from. And maybe the parents are realizing that this is anxiousness. Um, but the, the children may not be able to verbalize um, that they're, they're feeling this, this anxiety. Um, so it's, it's really sitting down and having a conversation with them. Um, when they are not anxious. And, and actually another thing that I would recommend is maybe perusing a few YouTube videos that shows some visualization of this and shows them, you know, this is what anxiety is. Um, find something that, that resonates with your life beliefs and, and, and with that you would feel would be acceptable for your child and, and your child's developmental level and, and have a conversation with them. Maybe show them a video or two. Um, there are a lot of great resources online. Um, even uh, the, the uh, APA.org has uh, got some great resources for anxiety and, and, and talking about this with, with children as well. So I would prove some of those uh, resources as well in, in finding the best way to talk about this with, with our kids. Um, and then just also tell them these are some of the things that I am seeing. And this is what, what I think that, that you may be feeling and see if they will be able to come out and talk about that. Um, let's see if there's anything else that... I think, okay. question is, do doctors give sleep meds for kids who can't sleep? I don't know the answer to this. I have worked with many children and I, I don't know if I've ever worked with a child where there's been a, a medication prescribed um, uh, for those that can't sleep. Now I've seen many kids that, that have had uh, melatonin um, but that is generally the, the um, only thing that I've ever seen kids uh, take to really aid uh, in that sleep initiation. OK. 
Okay. I think I've covered, okay, there's another one. Can young children do CBT? How young? Um, yes, young children can do CBT. And, and we can start talking about CBT at five or six, but CBT at five or six looks a lot different than, than someone that um, is in their teen years. Um, and, and it's going to involve a lot of social stories. It's going to, um, it may involve a lot of, uh, it might Im involve a lot of play techniques. Um, and, and, you know, for, for boys, sometimes it's, it's, you know, these are my superhero techniques that I'm going to use. Or for girls, um, it might be something similar to that. So yes, CBT can be used for, for young children, but it, it takes a really experienced clinician on how to do that. Um, do you feel that tippy toe walking is related to anxiousness in young children? Uh, I have I have heard some of that the um, um, the connections between toe walking and other things. Um, I. I don't know if I have a, a good answer to that. That's not something I am, I'm very well versed in. Um, so I, I apologize, I don't have an answer for that one. Any other questions right now? I'm missing anything on the chat. I'm going to try to go up to the chat. Okay. How much exercise is recommended for a preteen? I don't know if I have, I know 30 minutes a day is generally the, the, a good recommendation. Um, I am sure that there is, if, if you Google that and you'd find a very repu reputable source that would, would talk about how much exercise, I am guessing it's gonna say probably about an hour to two a day for a preteen. It might actually even be more than that. Um, so, but, but then it's like, how do you define the exercise? Uh, does that mean that, that, um, um, that we're, we're doing mile long runs, you know, probably not It's probably the play activities and other things outside, or uh, a lot of other things can, can be, um, in that box of, of exercise. And, and when I say, when I say exercise, I'm not saying that we need to go out to run marathons, but, but you know, um, getting in our daily steps, going out for a half an hour walk. Um, um, it is good if we do some of that vigorous exercise uh, a few times a week. If there's a lot of connections with the research that if we go for an intense run or a good long run, that aerobic exercise or even weightlifting can be very, very helpful. But even yoga and, and things that um, um, some may not think as super vigorous. Okay. So I'm going to read uh, this next question. My child seems to com compartmentalize home as a safe nest without stress. So doing homework can be anxiety provoking because he feels like he has left his stressful, challenging part of his day already when he left school. I don't want to take away his safe space, but as he gets older, homework increases. Do you have tips to help him with that? I worry he will fall way behind. So we do need to, to move to a place where we want that to be that safe place. And I think there's, there's a way um, um, to continue to create that safe place for them. And I think my recommendation would be to, to use a strategy called that that would that'd be almost like an exposure type of piece where you start off, you no, know, tonight we're gonna to do two minutes. We're gonna set this timer. I really want you to work on this homework for two minutes. And then 
Um, and then the next, and maybe do that every week. And if you do that every day this week, we're gonna give you this reward, okay? And, and make a little bit of a contract with that kid. And then slowly increase your increments of, um, of, of doing this increase with homework. You might be doing two minutes a night. Now we're gonna go up to five minutes a night for the next week. We're gonna slowly get up to seven to 10. So, so we're not just moving into it super fast. We're making slow, deliberate changes. And then we're tying that to another reward for them. That would be my recommendation. Right. Any more questions? Okay. All right. Um, please feel free to email me if you do have questions. Uh, Joanna, is, is this, I know that we recorded this, but are the slides, do we have those available to them if they need them, want them? Yes, so um, keep your eyes on your email tomorrow. You'll get an email from me and it will have a link for the slides as well as um, my email address. So if you need CEU credits, let me know. And um, we'll also have the recording available on our website and the link for that will be in the email as well. Okay. All right, thank you for joining me tonight. You guys all have a safe and warm night. Thanks everybody.